Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Bhagavad Gita. We want to continue our Dhamma talk. Today, the Sutta we are going to discuss is called Penetrative Insight. It's called in Pali Nibbedika Pariyaya. The way of uh, practicing the, the practice that leads to insight and liberation. You have a translation with you. Here are several translations. I printed one for you and uh, there may be a little difference between here and there. The Buddha said, because I will teach you a penetrative exposition of the Dhamma. Somebody translates uh, exposition of the teaching. Uh, and listen and attend a uh, little, little and attend closely, I will speak. So, then the, when the bell, they said, just when the bell said, oh yes, Bhante, those bhikkhus, uh, so the question, or the reply. We have to remember when Buddha addressed bhikkhus, this discourse is not directed directly only to bhikkhus. This is even among community, there were lay people as well. So when Buddha said bhikkhus, because they are in front, like some of you sitting in front of me, others are sitting at the back. So lay people always give priority to monks. So monks take first, you know, front line or front rows and others sit behind. And therefore Buddha, when Buddha spoke, he spoke to the monks who are close to him. And there were big kunis, lay men, lay women in the crowd. So Buddha said, uh, pleasure should be understood, or some people say uh, pleasure should be known. You may have the translation says that pleasure should be known. Pleasure should be understood. The source and origin of pleasure should be understood. The diversity of sensual pleasure should be understood. The results of sensual pleasure should be understood. The cessation of the sensual pleasure should be understood. And the path leading to cessation of sensual pleasure should be understood. It's very simple. <laughs> very simple on the, in, on the, in the paper and superficially it sounds, looks like a very simple thing. And same thing goes with feeling. This in this discourse, Buddha selected six items. Uh, in different discourses, Buddha selects different items. In this discourse, he selected six items. One is sensual pleasure. Other is feeling. You are familiar with uh, form, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness. Here Buddha used different terms. His first, instead of form, he used sensual pleasure, karma, sensual pleasure. Second is the same as feeling. Third is perception is the same. Fourth in other places is uh, perception. 
but in this place the number 4 is tens. I mentioned tens yesterday. Tens are uh, sometimes called asava. Uh, even in here, uh, Buddha used the word asava in Pali. Uh, asava means uh, uh, that which is permanent that gives uh, once you get some certain things permanent for a long period of time and when you drink it that gives you a good kick so that is called asava and we get that kick from our asava that we are brewed inside we are brewed our asavas our our, uh, what do you call, uh, what do you call, uh, booster inside, to get boost, boosted, to get drunk. We can get drunk from Kamasava, Bhavasava, Avijjasava, Dittasava. Kamasava means fermentation of sensual pleasures. We are actually so much uh, infatuated, so much uh, drunk, intoxicated with sensual pleasures. We don't have to elaborate it. With our eyes, ears, tongue, body and mind, we uh, we have we are completely uh, conditioned by these sensual pleasures because it has brewed in our mind for long, long period of time in this life as well as in samsara. Let alone samsara that we we cannot see. But we know at least, we remember at least this life from childhood up to now, how much we have been uh, intoxicated with sensual pleasures, trying to please our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. Uh, we have done so many things, seen so many things, heard so many things, smelled so many things, touched so many things and thought so many things. Yes, too. And then we get drunk of all these sensual pleasures. And anyway, in this discourse, Buddha used tense or asava. Uh, he said asava should be understood uh, and uh, source and origin of it should be understood. Diversity of change should be understood. The results of change should be understood. The cessation of change should be understood. And the path leading to the cessation of change should be understood. Now, I, at the same time, I think you, uh, something may ring in your mind when you hear this series. Ten should be understood. The cessation of change should be understood, and the path leading to cessation. What does it ring in your mind? Four noble truths. Cessation, path leading to cessation, are the two from the noble four noble truths, and ten is one dukkha. We deal with that separately. Then the karma should be understood. The source and origin of karma should be understood. The diversity of karma should be understood. The results of karma should be understood. The cessation of karma should be understood. The path leading to cessation of karma should be understood. 
then suffering should be understood. The source of uh, source and origin of suffering should be understood. The diversity of suffering should be understood. The cessation of suffering should be understood. The path leading to cessation of suffering should be understood. In each section, there are six items, six stages. First is, say for instance, suffering, one. Then the origin of suffering, two. <coughs> Third is diversity of suffering. Fourth is uh, what you call results of suffering should be understood. Fifth is cessation of suffering should be understood. Sixth is the path leading to the cessation of suffering should be understood. So each is described, explained in six ways. Six ways. Now, this is the introduction, or this is called Uddesa in Pali, presenting, giving it in summary at the very beginning. This is the Buddha's very special way of teaching. First, he gives, introduces the subject in brief. Then he elaborates. As I mentioned yesterday in my talk, the sutta means, what is the, what is the meaning of sutta? Well said. When a piece of literature is well said, for instance, an essay, there is an introduction, there is a body, and there is a conclusion. Introduction, the body, and conclusion. So in every discourse you can see Buddha followed that uh, structure. So this is the introduction. Now he goes to the body. When it was said sensual pleasure should be understood, the source and origin of sensual pleasure should be understood, diversity should be understood, the result should be understood, cessation should be understood, the value of cessation should be understood. For what reason was this said? Ah, now he's going to explain. He, he repeated the same thing already twice. Why did he do that? Because those days they didn't have notebooks, computers, writing material. They all learn from listening. When you, when you pay, that's why Buddha says always, pay total mindful attention, I will tell. They pay total mindful attention, and they can absorb every word in order to make it easy for them to remember Buddha repeated three times, four times, five times the same thing. So he, re he repeated the same thing this time again and he said for one reason was this said there are because these five five objects of sensual pleasures. Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and pleasing, connected with sensual pleasures, tantalizing. And this is the description he gave of the sound, uh, smell, taste, touch, and all these other four, five quarters of sensual pleasures. The same description for the sound, uh, cognizable by the ear, that is wished for, that means we wish for that particular sight, in this case sight, sound, smell, taste and touch. We wish for that. 
and desired, we desire it, and we, it is agreeable to us that particular sensual, particular thing that comes out to our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, should be agreeable to us. Then pleasing, connected with sensual pleasures, tantalizing. When Buddha explained things, he used so many synonyms, so many words to, make, to emphasize the meaning. All these are almost synonymous. He used these several uh, epithets, several adjectives, several adverbs with same meaning in order to make it very clear and emphasize the meaning so that we will not forget. Even if we remember one of them, that is enough. But in order to make it very clear, he said uh, this repeatedly. Then he said, uh, in the noble one's discipline, these are called objects of sensual pleasures. These are objects of sensual pleasures. They are themselves not sensual pleasures, but they are objects of sensual pleasures. And where is the sensual pleasure is then? And uh, they, Buddha said, they are not sensual pleasures. They pretty things in the world. They are there. They don't, uh, you know, thrust into our mind and generate sensual pleasures. No, they are there. They are there. Person's sensual pleasure is lustful intention. That is where sensual pleasure is. Lustful intention. I want to have it. I want to enjoy it. I like it. I want to make it my, my own. I possess it. I must possess it. And so forth and so on. In the inside we create another mechanism inside ourselves. Objects are there. <laughs> this computer, it is just there. But if I think, oh, it's beautiful, it is useful, it is expensive, I want to have it, I want to keep it, I want to steal it, I want to take away. I keep my, in, my, in my room, near my bedroom, bed, and so forth and so on, we, inside our mind, we create all sorts of things regarding this object. Object doesn't jump into the mind and do, take me, take me, enjoy me, enjoy me, like me, like me. Objects don't do that. They are not jumping characters like in, <laughs> in Arizona there are characters called jumping characters. When you go close by, it jumps. <laughs> it is not like, like some snakes. <laughs> when you go by, by them, they jump and bite, like cats and dogs. Objects are just neutral. They may be animate or inanimate. Man, woman, child, house, and camera, anything. They are just there. But our intention, sensual pleasures, is lustful intention. The pretty things remain just as they are in the world. They are there 
they just grow and appear inside. You know, they just they mind their own business. It is us who go and interfere. <laughs> But the wise remove the desire for them. So the job is in us. We have to look at our minds and we have to take care of our mind. We don't try to meddle with objects. We don't have to meddle with them. So, and what is the diversity of sensual pleasures? Sensual desire for form is one thing. Sensual, sensual desire for sound is another. Sensual desire for order is still another. Sensual desire for taste is still another. And sensual desire for tactical, tactile objects is still another. They don't mix together. What I sensual desire for forms, what the I, E Y E, not I capital I, E Y E, I, I does, E I cannot do. E I cannot see a form. So, the visual, visuality or vision is different from hearing. And vision brings certain amount of desire. Hearing brings, sound brings another type of desire. Ear brings the desire to hear. And that sounds generates no desire inside. Sight cannot do that. Vision cannot do that. Somebody is deaf, but vision is good. That person cannot enjoy the sound, but that person enjoys the sight. And therefore, form is one thing, sensual desire for uh, what you call the sensual desire for forms is one thing. Sensual desire for sound is another. This is called diversity of sensual pleasure. We derive sensual pleasure from different, different, different objects, different things. Some people enjoy reading using eyes. Some people enjoy hearing, listening to music. Some people enjoy tasting, eating, 24 hours, nibbling, good, bad, junk, and so keep eating as a nervous habit, enjoying it. Some people enjoy smelling, sweet smells, perfumes, flowers, and so on. So, desire for taste and sensual desire for tactile objects. Some people enjoy touching, hugging, kissing, sleeping together. Other people don't enjoy that. So, they like tactile object to enjoy sensual pleasures. This is diversity of sensual pleasure. As I mentioned, so many things are there that bring so much pleasure, we are really inundated with that, intoxicated, drugged, infatuated with sensual pleasures, oozing everywhere, <laughs> all sort of things to make us 
enjoy, to make, to enjoy. What is the result of sensual pleasure? One produces an individual existence and corresponds with whatever sense pleasures one desires and which may be consequence either of merits or demerits. What, this is the result of sensual pleasure. That means we wish to be born in certain places. When you have pleasant, sensu pleasant sensation, we like to continue it. We like to perpetuate it, continue it in this life and the next life and born in karma loka. Karma loka. Loka means the whole world is one karma, one sensual pleasure. That's called karma loka. In the karma loka, we, there are, we have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. And there are objects in the karma loka to please these senses. And if we let them alone, let them alone, they don't jump on, upon us. And they will rape us. Sensual objects outside don't rape us. We are the one who goes out and rape them. And therefore, in this life, we try to enjoy all these sensual pleasures. There are so many. Our life is so short. Maximum maybe 100 years. But the things we have to enjoy are trillions. How can we finish enjoying all of them? We cannot. Then we think, oh. I could not do such and such and such and such a thing in this life. Maybe next life I enjoy them. So be born in the another sensual plane, human, even divine, or oh, even animals. Nobody likes to be born as animals. Do you think anybody likes? Nobody. But this is a very beautiful teaching of the Buddha. We really don't like to be born as a dog or a cow, donkey, horse. No matter how beautiful they are, we can enjoy them, but nobody likes to be born as a horse. We make Kentucky Derby and uh, <laughs> go winning races and bring him money, and still nobody likes to be born as a horse. But we have committed so many unwholesome karmas, at the moment of death, horse's womb appears in our mind as a very pleasant, beautiful place. That is, and we are born there. Last moment, it creates situation for the mind to be mind to be attracted to that particular place. That's why we even become animals after death. Anyway, consequence of the results of uh, karma, or results of sensual pleasure, is the birth in different, 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 different places. What is the cessation of sensual pressure? With the cessation of contact, there is a cessation of sensual pressure. Sensual pressure arises from contact. When we contact with eyes, sensual pressure arises in the mind. When we contact the ear, contact sound with the ear, pressure arises in the mind. When we contact the smell through the nose, pleasure arises. Similarly, when we contact the body with the body, pleasure arises. 
and so forth. So that is the results of sensual pleasure. The cessation of sensual pleasure is the cessation of this uh, contact. That leading to cessation of sensual pleasure is what is that? Noble eight fold path. Friends, I ask you, how can we cease, stop sensual pleasure by following the noble eight fold path? I want to ask, the, ask you this question for you to think. But I don't have time to wait until you think and give me the answer. Because we have not thought it in advance. We have to think it again from now on. But I can give you the answer to make it easy for you. What is the Noble Eightfold Path? Right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right life, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. This is the state. Number one of this is right understanding. What is the right understanding? Understanding of many, many things. Four noble truths. Understanding the four noble truths, right understanding. In the Four Noble Truths, we understand number one, Dukkha, suffering. Suffering doesn't arise by itself. We have to understand we suffer by not understanding suffering. In order to understand suffering, we must understand a very important thing that is called Impermanence. Understand impermanence. Because what is impermanent is suffering. Yadani chantan dukkham. Whatever is impermanent, that is suffering. Therefore, the first thing we have to understand is impermanence. When we understand impermanence, we can see sensual pleasures. Because sensual pleasure is impermanent. Sensual pleasure is not permanent. It is impermanent. That is why we have to repeat it again and again and again and again. To keep up with sensual pleasures, we have to repeat it. Don't we? We have to repeat sensual pleasures. For instance, eating is a, is a pleasure. In order to get that pleasure, we have to eat again and again. We have to eat in the morning, we have to eat at lunchtime, we have to eat in the evening, we have to eat in between, we have to eat today, we have to eat tomorrow. We keep repeating. Eat, 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 and eat to get the sensual pleasure from eating. Why we do that? Because eating is impermanent. Whatever we eat, that is impermanent. So we understand, this is called understanding Dhamma with wisdom. Yada Panya Pasati. Dhamma must, understand, must be understood with wisdom. There is no any other way to understand Dhamma. No other way to understand the truth. We have to understand with wisdom. So, Sensual pleasure can be ceased, can be brought to an end by understanding impermanence of sensual pleasure. It is impermanent. That is how Noble Eightfold Path helps us to overcome desire, sensual pleasure. Noble Eightfold Path, the cessation of sensual pleasure. We, re we hear in many, many places 
in order to bring suffering to an end, we have to follow the noble eightfold path. Then we begin to wonder how noble eightfold path bring suffering to an end. The key is understanding the first of the four noble truths. What is the first is understanding, right understanding, understanding of what? Impermanence, suffering, selflessness. We have to understand it. Only when we understand these three things, the rest is easy. We can think correctly, we can speak correctly, we can act correctly, we have, can live right livelihood correctly, we can make effort correctly, we can practice mindfulness correctly, and we gain concentration correctly, right concentration. All begin with right understanding. That is how we come, we bring sensual pleasures to an end by following that. Then, what is the result of, then we go to the feelings. Uh, feelings should be understood. Because, because these three feelings, pleasant, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neither pleasant nor Painful, neither painful nor pleasant feeling. And what is the source and origin of feelings? It is very obvious, contact. Contact is the source and origin of feelings. And what is the diversity of feelings? There is a worldly pleasant feeling, sometimes it is translated as material pleasant feeling. Immaterial pleasant feeling. Material painful feeling, immaterial painful feeling, material neither painful nor pleasant feeling, immaterial and neither pleasant or painful feeling. What is that? We have to understand what is material present feeling, what is immaterial present feeling. Material present feeling we all understand, as we mentioned earlier, through the senses, when we contact sensory objects, if our desire is there, then pleasant sensation arises, that is pleasant material feeling. What is pleasant spiritual feeling? That is, When we practice meditation, only when we practice meditation, you can have a spiritual pleasant feeling. Out of meditation, you can never have spiritual pleasant feeling. You must meditate. Meditate correctly. Only then can you have a pleasant spiritual feeling. When you meditate, you see all your hindrances subsides, hindrances subside, disappears. That time you have an immaterial present feeling. That disappearance of hindrances has nothing to do with the material thing. It is a mental state. It is not related to material object, sight, sound, smell, taste, and such. It has nothing to do with them. It is all mental state. When that mental state subsides, disappears, you have a one type of spiritual pleasant feeling. Another spiritual pleasant feeling is when you attain concentration, jhana, you have spiritual pleasant feeling. When you attain the second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, you have spiritual present feeling. When you attain stream entry, you have spiritual present feeling. 
स्ट्रीम एंट्री चौथा पांडव स्पिरिचुअल प्रेजेंटेशन व्हेन यू हैव सकद आगामी यू हैव स्पिरिचुअल प्रेजेंटेशन अनागामी एंड अनारहांत स्पिरिचुअल प्रेजेंटेशन नाउ आल्सो व्हेन यू सी एवरीथिंग इन invariably without any exception everything is impermanent you have a spiritual pleasant feeling why your suffering is impermanent not only pleasure even suffering is impermanent greed is impermanent hatred is impermanent jealousy is impermanent fear is impermanent anxiety is impermanent you see not only one particular thing everything means everything is impermanent then you have a great pleasure that is called spiritual pleasant feeling they were impermanent in the past they are impermanent now they will be impermanent in future in all three times they are impermanent is it not a pleasure it is the greatest pleasure to see with wisdom you see this with wisdom you see all this in the past present and future all are impermanent great pleasure here i see this then you know material dukkha material suffering worldly suffering worldly dukkha understood when you don't get what you want you have a suffering if you lost what you got already you have suffering when you are separated from loved ones you are suffering when you live with somebody whom you like and then after and that the pleasure slowly withering and uh, diminishing you have suffering pleasure is subject to diminish you have diminishing return diminishing return all sensual pleasure diminish then diminishing return begin to operate <laughs> you are suffering with regard to sensual pleasures we all understand that what is the spiritual painful feeling what is the spiritual painful feeling the spiritual painful feeling is when you practice it also it related to meditation you practice meditation when you practice meditation you follow every tiny little instruction every bit of it you follow you follow every rule in the book so to say and you meditate every single day many hours a day day and night but you are still in the same place you feel you are in a plateau no more, no progress you are still in the same place but you have heard oh so and so attain liberation so and so gain jhana so and so is successful in meditation so and so attain enlightenment stream entry and so forth and you see then dukkha suffering arises in your mind thinking gee how can i attain it when can i attain it i follow the rules i follow the practice i am so diligent so consci- conscientious i still in the same place so and so at any like that suffering arises in your mind 
that is nothing to do with anything material. That all related to spiritual attainment. You have not attained it. So and so attain it. Then you have, you are not jealous. You are not envious. You are not angry. You are not pity. Pity on yourself. You think, how can I attain it? What arises in your mind at that time is spiritual urgency, Dhamma Sangvega. Dhamma Sangvega, spiritual urgency. Vega means speed. Sangvega means additional speed. You speed up your practice. Look at your instructions. Follow your instructions more closely. Try whether you understood the instruction correctly. Ask where you went wrong. Where we, you went wrong in meditation. And correct it. You boost your energy. Boost up your energy. And practice more vigorously. No jealousy. No envy. No anger. But you chide yourself, you chide yourself and say, I must do it more vigorously. That is a spiritual pain, a spiritual suffering. Then you have material indifference, material equanimity. Neither painful nor pleasant feeling, material. That means, <coughs> you remember this uh, sour grapes, sour grape episode. You try and try and try and you don't get it, then you say, yeah, who wants it? That kind of equanimity. A spiritual equanimity is not like that. A spiritual equanimity is Again, you see everything is impermanent, everything is unsatisfactory, everything is without self. There is nothing to excite, nothing to be particularly uh, rejoiced, but you have even-mindedness at that time balanced state of mind, equanimous state of mind. That is what the Buddhas had, that is what the enlightened persons had, that is what you have when you attain the highest jhana. Mind remains equal, equanimous. That is called spiritual, neither pleasant nor unpleasant feeling. With regard, uh, regard to feeling. Then, uh, feeling. The next one is perception. Similarly, there are six kinds of perception. What are six kinds of perception? Perception of form, perception of feeling, perception of sound. Perception of smell, perception of touch, perception of mental thought, mental uh, thought. They are called in Pali, Rupa Sanya, Sadha Sanya, Gandha Sanya, Rasanya, Pukta Sanya, Dhamma Sanya. Perception of form, perception of uh, sound, perception of smell, perception of taste, perception of touch, perception of mental object. Now, so we, under, we should understand the perception. And here it is, they are mentioned here. And what is the source and origin of perception? Contact is the source and origin. Even for contact, even for perception, contact is important. For the 
sensation contact is important, feeling is contact is important, perception for perception contact is important. So there are uh, contact, also six kind of contacts. Uh, that is eye contact, ear contact, nose contact, tongue contact, body contact, mind contact. Through these six kind of contacts, perception arises. As soon as we contact something, perception arises. As soon as we contact something, feeling arises. Whatever we feel, we perceive. That's what we mentioned yesterday. What we feel, we perceive. Then perception arises. What is the diversity of perception? Perception of form is one thing. Perception of sound is another. Just like before, the feeling, desire, different from one another. Perception through the eye is different from perception of the sound. I mean, perception of uh, sight is different from perception of sound. You cannot get the perception of sound from your eyes. You can get the perception of sound from the ear. Similarly, we cannot get perception of smell through the tongue. We have to get the perception of smell through the nose and so forth. So they are different from one another. And what is the result of perception? I said that perception results in, in expression uh, in whatever we, we one uh, perceives something. In just that way, the one expresses itself. I was percipient of such and such. That means I'm perceiving such and such. Perception is used only for communication. Perception is used for communication. Vohara vepakkam beke sanyangvadani, Buddha said. Vohara vepakkam. The perceptions, uh, the, the, what you call, uh, diversity of perception is depending on the expression. <coughs> then what is the cessation of perception with the cessation of contact? There is a perception. And the way to do that is the noble age soul path. Again, we have to use the noble age call in the same way as I mentioned earlier in order to get rid of this perception of uh, perception. Okay. <coughs> when noble disciples understood a perception, the source and origin of perception, diversity of perception, the results of perception, the cessation of perception, and the way leading to the cessation of perception. He understands this penetrative, penetrative spiritual life to be the cessation of perception. You see, then number four. See, at the end of each paragraph, Buddha said, for this reason, I mentioned at the beginning such and such. Uh, I think I better continue this without giving more details. Then these three tens, tens means asava, I mentioned earlier. Uh, when it was said, ten should be understood and so forth. Because there are, uh, because these three tens, uh, sometimes they are called 
influx. Uh, sometimes they are called uh, in, in English uh, fermentation. Uh, sometimes things that uh, brood in our mind. They are sensuality, the taint of existence, the taint of ignorance. Sensuality we mentioned already. Fermentation of sensuality. Uh, asava. Then fermentation of action, bhavasava. And fermentation of ignorance, avijjasava. Three types of asavas. The source of them is ignorance. Ignorance is their source and origin. Because of ignorance, these three types of taints, fermentations, exist, depending on ignorance. And uh, then, and what is the diversity of taints? There are taints leading to hell, there are taints leading to animal realms, there are taints leading to the realm of uh, affliction, afflicted spirits. There are taints leading to the human world. There are taints leading to the divine world. So it is the, what do you call this, uh, fermentation or asava that brings life into various existence. Hell. If one likes to go there, one must brew this fermentation. If one likes to go to animal kingdom, make this fermentation. That goes in that direction. And then if you want to go to human realms, be a human now. <laughs> have humane qualities to be born as a human. If you want to be divine, practice divine qualities like metta. At the end of metta discourse, you see, etam, uh, Brahma metam vihara mahu. This is called divine life living in this world. We live a divine life in this world when we practice metta. And then after that we go to divine realm. Okay. So friends, this uh, gong doesn't permit us to continue. So gong rang and we have to stop here. Uh, the rest you can see in my notes. And uh, please take notes with you in your leisure time. Read these notes and try to digest the meaning. Understand the notes and try to read it several times and think very carefully. This is the purpose of this Sutta study retreat. We give something for you to take home and reread it, reread it, and try to understand it even better. Okay. <laughs>